So basically what we're gonna be talking about today, we, there are two parts to the webinar. I'm gonna start us off talking a little about the notice of interpretation. Uh, this was something that we covered in the webinars that we had uh, last August. So if you participated there, this will be a refresher. If you were not a part of that, then this will kind of bring you up to speed uh, in kind of a very brief way on what the notice of interpretation did and what it means for NIMAS. And then the second part, the, the meat of this webinar is actually going to be the section that, uh, that Luis and Lynn cover on the new NIMAS exemplar and uh, talking about that process and uh, how, how that worked for them and, and some, of the, some of the more technical issues in terms of, of taking the EPUB and turning it into a NIMAS file that was valid. So um, I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. Um, there is the chat if you need to ask a question. I'm also here with uh, Liz Schaller is on and she'll be kind of monitoring the chat if there are any questions there. We do plan to have time for questions at the end. Um, and we are going to be recording this so that we can archive it and the slides will also be available later for anybody who's interested in those. So don't worry about taking any notes. So in terms of the notice of interpretation, this was something that happened in May of 2020 uh, that the Department of Education published a, a notice that clarified that the definition of print instructional materials in IDEA 2004 includes digital instructional materials. So um, NIMAS, of course, and the NIMAC are all um, defined in the IDEA 2004 legislation. And so uh, the scope of the NIMAC is defined within that legislation. And so it was very important. Uh, this was an important uh, notice in terms of basically giving us permission to not restrict the materials that we receive, uh, but to include materials that may not have a bound hard copy volume associated with them. So before the notice, that basically was the restriction. It had to be a hard copy printed book in order for us to accept an IMS file for it. But we can now accept files for materials that do not have a hard copy equivalent. You know, they may be uh, distributed in any uh, kind of digital format um, with of course the caveat that it has to be producible in a valid NIMAS format. And I'll talk a little about that in a moment. So the NIMAC so far has accepted 44 files that have been produced from digital instructional materials. Um, as well as a, a larger number of materials that started out as digital, but then the publisher switched over and decided to distribute a hard copy version. So kind of a similar sort of experience, but materials that do actually have a hard copy equivalent. So why is this important in terms of serving students with disabilities? Well, basically it's the same uh, rationale as with the NIMAS for print. Um, not all digital instructional materials are accessible. Um, and so when students with disabilities are unable to use the digital format distributed to other students, you know, that NIMAS file can be the starting point for producing the, the format uh, that they need in order to participate in the class. One of the things that's really important about this change is that the scope of NIMAS was expanded but the NIMAS file format itself has not changed. And so this is gonna be in the second part of the, of the webinar this morning, this is gonna be kind of a, an important piece in terms of that, that NIMAS 1.1 specification. It's based on the DAISY standard and it's designed to capture the content, the structure and the linear reading order of hard copy printed books. And so what this means for digital instructional materials is that we're talking about a subset of, of this larger bucket that we consider, you know, there is a range of digital products that are used in schools now. The materials that are appropriate for producing in NIMAS, they have to be ones that can meet that the specification of the NIMAS. And, and also uh, that would also include metadata. And so one of the important uh, pieces right now is that these materials have to have an ISBN. This is something we might revisit, you know, depending on how, how things evolve with NIMAS for digital. But at this time, we ask that materials do have an ISBN in order to be submitted. So again, when we're talking about that subset of materials that are appropriate to produce in NIMAS, we're talking about materials primarily composed of static images and text with minimal or no interactivity. 
That's basically what we're talking about. So for example, a digital text that is distributed in a PDF format, that is something that is going to be fairly easy and straightforward to turn into a NIMIS uh, file, at least in, maybe not in terms of the technical side, but in terms of the contents of the original resource. So if we're talking about materials, on the other hand, that are highly interactive, highly interactive digital materials are not really suitable to convert into NIMIS. So there's, again, a, lot, a wide range. There are a lot of educational games, there are apps, there's software that are used in educational settings today. Um, and someone might say, okay, well, we would consider that digital instructional materials. Uh, and that may be the case, but those types of products would not be appropriate to convert into NIMIS. Another, another uh, thing I just want to point out is that standardized tests, uh, they also remain outside of scope for NIMIS, whether or not they are uh, print or digitally based. So another thing I just want to hit on just really briefly is just to Note that uh, as with printed instructional materials, there is no blanket requirement for publishers to submit NIMIS. Um, the notice of interpretation has also not changed the mechanism for states and districts to require NIMIS from publishers. It's still uh, the linchpin here continues to be the adoption contract or the purchase agreement, and that NIMIS language in the procurement instrument is still the, where that requirement is uh, imposed. So. Again, just as with print materials, it's really up to the customer to be requiring NIMIS. Um, all that said, from the NIMAC standpoint, you know, we're, we are not involved in that piece and publishers are always very welcome to submit materials uh, voluntarily or in advance of a requirement. Um, that's not something that the NIMAC imposes in any way. It's simply that it's between the customer and the publisher in terms of how the legislation itself uh, imposes that requirement. So the last piece that I just wanna hit on briefly before I turn this over to the, the um, great folks at the AIM Center is that an important piece of the notice of interpretation is that there is an exemption for digital instructional materials that are out accessible out of the box, so to speak. So um, the, requirement that the notice actually references at this point is WCAG 2.0 AA as the set of requirements for meeting uh, 508 compliance. So digital materials that, that already meet that standard do not have to be supplied to the NIMAC. So um, in terms of what that definition is, we do expect that that will evolve over time as standards change. We, I know we're already beyond 2.0, um, but the important piece here is that um, while the notice of interpretation allows us to accept NIMIS for digital instruction materials, it also provides um, kind of a push for publishers, hey, go ahead and make these materials accessible in the versions that you're distributing directly to school because that's really, that's really um, what we want to see happen. And to wrap up, the last thing I just wanna say is that um, one of the issues that is pointed to in the notice of interpretation, but it's not quite resolved, it's acknowledged but not resolved, is that while there is a NIMIS exemption for accessible digital instructional materials, in some cases, hard copy braille will remain the appropriate accessible format for the student. And the reason that this is important is that there may be some cases where that digital format that's, that's sold or distributed directly to schools, that might be a format that could be used in Braille producing software to, to generate hard copy Braille if a student needs it. Um, but in other cases, that will not be the case. And so one of, the, one of the issues that we're still kind of trying to strategize around is that need for some type of source file for Braille production if an accessible format uh, excuse me, if, if the accessible format that's distributed to schools can't be used to produce Braille. So that's kind of a whirlwind tour of the notice itself. Um, and I'm going to hand this off now to Luis Perez at the National AIM Center. And if there are any questions about this, um, actually, Liz, are there, any, are there any questions at the chat in the chat at this point? I don't we have might. any questions right okay. now. Okay. Okay. If anybody has any questions, we can uh, be sure to circle back around those at the end. And at this point, I'm going to 
stop sharing my screen and hand it off to Luis. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Nicole, for that great introduction and uh, really nice overview of the Notice of Interpretation. Really appreciate that. And we also really appreciate the partnership with the NIMAC uh, and the opportunity to share with you this morning some of the work that we've done together. So I'm going to share my screen and then I'm going to turn it over actually to um, my partner, Lynn McCormack at CAST, and we'll do some quick introductions. And uh, then um, we're going to do a live demo. So fingers crossed, everybody. Uh, you know what? Anything can happen during a live demo. So, but we, we think we're going to pull it off. So Lynn, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Thanks, Luis. My name is Lynn McCormack. I'm a senior technologist at CAS. So some of my days I'm heads down writing code and other days I get to, to meet with good folks like you. So I'm really thrilled to be here with you representing the National AIM Center. And I'm excited for our presentation today. Luis? And I'm Luis Perez. I'm a technical assistant specialist at CAST. And most of my time is allotted to the National AIM Center, but I work with a number of other projects and uh, some of them I work with Lynn on. So it's always a pleasure to be able to co-present with her. Uh, we always have a really nice time presenting. So we look forward to sharing with you some of the work we've done on this uh, exemplar. All right, so the materials that we have today um, didn't start out just with this exemplar that we're working on. Um, it was previously in a, a, another digital form called UDL Editions, but digging back in the cast archives, apparently somewhere between 2000 and 2005, this content actually was in a printed book and a previous digital um, edition as well, but I do not know the exact um, origins or the project that that was on, but I know it uh, as in part of UDL Editions, which was a, a previous um, uh, digital environment that had some flash in it and is not working so well right now. So it's pretty much being um, being being laid to rest. And so we have a new project that I'm working on called Clusive. And Clusive takes their content in an EPUB format as well as some auxiliary materials such as glossaries. And that's in a JSON format. And I can show you that later. Um, but the, the format that the UDL editions used, this is probably pretty similar. I've heard that many publishers out there use some sort of XML format. We've always been um, in, the, in and around the DAISY format, but we are, we are cast. And generally, our content includes a lot of supports and scaffolds that don't fit nicely into the DAISY format. So we call it DAISY XML+. Plus. So that format we use to convert into EPUB for used inclusive. And then we use that format that we converted into the 9S XML as well. And before we get going uh, and look at the exemplar, I just wanna share that we have a number of resources that you can reference. Uh, we do have an FAQ or frequently asked questions on the AIM Center website. Uh, so we're happy to share that with you. And thank you, Liz, for posting that in the chat. Um, just one caveat about that. We are actually updating to a new website in the next week or so, uh, but have no fear. Uh, we will have redirects. So if you bookmark uh, any of these websites uh, on the National AIM Center uh, website, uh, you know, any of these pages, you'll be able to get them uh, through those redirects. So that FAQ just addresses some of the common questions that we've received. Um, uh, Nicole addressed some of those in the first part of the webinar, but uh, there may be others in that FAQ. So uh, we uh, reference that quite a bit. And then um, we also have the exemplar itself. Uh, the exemplar has uh, lots of comments in it. So it's a great learning tool. And again, that's available on the National AIM Center website. Um, and then finally, Clusive. So Lynn is going to introduce Clusive, and then I'm going to be showing you a quick tour of the title that we're using for the exemplar. Super. Thanks, Louise. So Clusive is another, it's a part of the Sizzle Project, the Center for Inclusive Software for Learning, the Sizzle Project at CAST. And Clusive is our open source, openly available tool. Um, the software itself is fully downloadable from, from GitHub. And um, the book that we're going to show you book, I'll use in quotes, um, all about coyotes is inside of that Clusive tool. And you can try it out yourself. Um, you can log in as a guest. Um, Luis is going to show you how to do that. And if you're interested in, in the tool at all, please do feel free to contact us 
and we'd be interested in showing you around that tool a little bit more as well. But it's going to be a great, a great resource for us to really work through what does it look like to have a digital digital materials that's accessible in digital environment. And what does that look like? And when I try to convert that into a NIMIS file set. So it's a great, great example for us to use today. Great. And Liz just share the link to Clusive, but just in case it is Clusive, C-L-U-S-I-V-E, like Victor, V-E, that cast.org. And so that's where I'm going to head to next. So keep your fingers crossed, live demo, live TV, as they say. Okay, so I am here at clusive.cast.org. And like Lynn said, uh, you can all try this out. You can log in as a guest or try Clusive as a guest. And then you'll see the number of titles listed here that are available on Clusive. And we are going to choose All About Coyotes, which is the title that this exemplar is based on. Perfectly timed phone call. Hopefully it's not uh, distracting you too much. And um, this is one of the things that uh, is special about Clusive is that um, yes, we have the content, but there are also some interactive elements here. So whenever you launch one of these titles, there is a uh, small activity to complete at the beginning that will help you uh, basically establish where you are in terms of the content and the vocabulary. So we're going to skip this activity for now, but just to know that that's one of the interactive elements and we're probably going to reference some of the vocabulary that's in this activity a little bit later. So for now, I'm just going to skip this activity and go right into the title. And because I was looking at it a little bit earlier, it landed me on this page. But one of the things I want to highlight about Clusive is that if I go over to the right-hand side, there is a cog symbol. And I can open up that cog. And what's unique about Clusive is that it is based on the universal design for learning principles that were pioneered at CAST. And it's also an accessible reading experience. So here you have all kinds of options for adjusting the text size, line spacing, letter spacing, choosing fonts, and so on. So again, that's available through that cog over on the right side of the screen. And then on the left side of the screen, we have our uh, table of contents. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up the table of contents and that shows me the different sections of this title. And I'm gonna show you first the title page. And as uh, Nicole mentioned, here is that NIMAC ISBN. So there's that requirement to have that ISBN. So this is the ISBN for the version that would be submitted to the NIMAC and it's right there on the cover page. I'll go back to the table of contents and then I'm just gonna walk you through a number of sections here. I'm gonna go to coyotes and their families and you can see some of the beautiful imagery. These are all Creative Commons images that we were able to find. And for each of these images, there is a reference for it. So we're giving credit um, to the author of the image. And we've implemented those references using the notes element. So I can follow these links and it takes me to the end of the book where we'll see a list of the credits uh, using the notes feature. And Lynn will show you that in the code in just a second. I'll go back here and to the table of contents and I'm gonna choose habitats next because I wanna show you something really cool here. We have a complex image, uh, it's a map. So it's not uh, just a simple image of a coyote but rather a complex map that shows um, you know, their habitats across North and Central America. And with this map, in addition to having the credit using the notes element, we also have in this digital version, uh, a long description that we've implemented using the details uh, element that's available in EPUB. So here we can launch the image in a much bigger version where it's much easier to see, especially for somebody like me that has low vision. And then the long description appears uh, right below the image. And so that's a, a popover and I can close that when I'm done reviewing the image and the long description. Next, I'm gonna go to communication in the table of contents. And then here we can see we have an interactive element. Uh, this is a player for one of the sound files that's embedded in the coyote's title. So you're gonna hear a coyote yelping if this works right. So 
So this is a fully, did that come through, Lynn? Yes, it did. Great. So this is a fully um, multimedia experience. You have the images, you have some sound files. There's actually several of those files embedded uh, throughout the title uh, so that you get to experience some of the different calls of the coyotes. So it really is all about coyotes from the images to the text to the audio of their different calls. And then uh, the last thing I want to do here is go to fact or fiction, because I want to show you a little bit of that vocabulary and the glossary feature. So there is an option in uh, the uh, occlusive uh, application where you can highlight the vocabulary within the text. So it's much easier to find. And then when I select one of these vocabulary items, it opens it up in a nice window um, and here we have not just the definition and the part of speech, we also have a sentence that shows you how that vocabulary is used in context. We have a nice image. So this uh, one is predator. So we're using the lion as an example of that. And then uh, just like in the text itself, we can open up uh, using that details element. We can bring up a nice big image of the lion with a long description. And Lynn is going to talk about how we um, handled um, having interactive elements like this glossary, which is uh, adaptive. Um, but in the NIMAC version, it is not. So again, that's something that is a little bit different. It's not a one-for-one -one conversion. Some of those uh, adaptive interactive elements uh, we have to account for. So you're going to see that uh, as Lynn digs into the exemplar a little bit more. And then at the end, as I said, um, we have the credits and these are all uh, notes at the uh, end of the book and the images are all creative commons, but we've given credit to all of the authors uh, there. So let me pause there, uh, see if there are any questions. Um, I see one come through. So David Nelson, hi David, good to see you. David has the questions. Will audio files be described in a similar way to how the image content is described? So um, the um, so the audio that you were listening to, there was some context to that in that paragraph around that audio, as well as the caption, which told you what was actually happening in that. So where it says that um, a coyote is yelping, it doesn't it doesn't actually go into the description of the sounds itself, because um, that really is you have to. There, it's an auditory component. There isn't a text kind of equivalent for that. So um, there's the context and the caption. So that's really the description that exists. And we will look at this on the NIMIS side um, because obviously that's impossible to um, recreate on the NIMIS side. So we'll show you how we handled that on that side. Good question though. So we'll show you a number of these elements with a side-by-side -side comparison of what it looks like in the occlusive environment and then what the code looks like. Um, but we're really excited about occlusive. It's a, a great application of um, universal design for learning principles as well as accessibility and it creates a really personalized experience for learners. Um, so now the challenge is how do we transfer that over into a NIMAC file? So I'm gonna bring up the slides. Um, if you have any other questions, thank you, David, for that question. If you have any other ones, uh, as we go through these code examples, please uh, use the chat. Uh, you can also unmute yourself if that's uh, easier. So let me bring back the slides and we'll Super. pick it up here. And while you're doing that, so Clusive right now, um, there wasn't a way to create a login, but um, by the end of March, we'll have that available. So um, if you're interested in using that or know that know of folks or classrooms that might wanna use this tool, um, it will be fully available by the end of um, March. We'll be doing a, a launch and then we'll be doing a larger launch um, in April as well. So look, look, come back and look again later. Um, we're adding new features uh, every day into that, into that tool, so. Terrific. All right, great. So I wanna bring back some of the thoughts from last week as well. Nicole did a great job last week um, introducing us to the parts of the 
um, the NIMIS file set and some do's and don'ts. So one of the things we talked about last week was the table of contents. And so here is the exam example of the table of contents for our All About Coyotes contents. And so one of the things I did want to point out, we were really fortunate that one of the sections had a subsection. So we're using the list as um, we talked about last week. Um, and then in the middle, you can see there's a depth equals two. So if, if you want to highlight that where it says appearance, family life, and diet, you can see that um, we use that uh, layering. Um, and so that's how we did it on the NIMIS side. On the, on the um, inclusive side, we had used an XML file. And so in that, um, we, I mean, the, the um, EPUB file, and in that we use the, the navigation um, HTML format. But as you can see, the way they come out side by side, one of the things that's different about this is because this did not come from a printed copy, and we actually went back and forth on this when we developed this um, to figure out, should we put page numbers in or not? Should we force page numbers into the digital environment so that, um, then, then folks would know in the print version, kind of where do I map, how do I map? And in the end, we decided it just didn't work right because it didn't have the same equivalent. We put them in and they would end up, if you, if you made your font much bigger, the page number ended up somewhere strange and it just didn't make any sense. So we did put a note in here that said there are no page numbers in the original digital resource. And so therefore there's no page numbers here in this um, NIMIS file set. So that's something that's a little bit different from a print where you're wanting to be able to come back and point to a specific um, page number. So that does not exist. Any questions about the table of contents? Okay, we can go on then. All right, super. So right on the first page, um, we had the, um, the, the um, ISBN, which we had already, um, Luis had note, noted, and that's a really important part of being able to connect your digital version to your NIMIS version to be able to have that, um, the ISBN that's showing. But right up front, one of the things that we, um, we had to adjust for is that we didn't have the images, um, the images that we had that went all the way back to 2000 didn't have rights and permissions that we needed for inclusive because inclusive, the content inclusive is all creative comments or openly licensed. So the images that we had, there's two reasons we couldn't use them. One was because um, we needed openly licensed and two was we didn't have the 300 DPI that we needed for. Um, so anyway, um, looking at creative commons that the licensing requirements for print is actually very different from the licensing requirements for, for digital. And in order to maintain usage of Creative Commons materials, you have to have the licensing exactly the way they want the licensing. So um, you can see the difference here where you can see um, on the on the right hand side, there's a link where on the left hand side, you have to spell everything out and use it in the long form. So that was another um, content um, consideration that we had to have as we as we move through the material. Any questions on that? Okay, so we can go on to the image resolution. Super. So one of the, one of the issues with this was um, what I just said was that our original images that we had for this content were not uh, openly licensed or we didn't have the license because these images were going back 20 years. Also, in the case of this map, the map went back 20 years. So we had to look for an updated map for where the, the coyotes actually live. So Luis and I worked with an instructional designer who really put together, um, helped us put together this material and approve these, um, the language and those sort of things. And so um, she helped us with this. And um, what you can see here is this was the image that had the long description inside of Clusive. And so um, we put a note in here because last week we talked about this, that it's not required to have alt text, even though Luis and I love being able to have alt text. And we really do strongly encourage the use of alt text, even though it's not required by, uh, by NIMIS. And one of the things on this one is we were talking about this last week is whether you ever put the um, prod note required so in this case, um, as you can see the prod note here, we put it as required. And that is because that the 
the prod note here actually describes the image and what's important in the image. So it says this map shows the range of coyotes from 1900 through 2016. The territory that coyotes, coyotes live in today covers most of North and Central America. This area is bigger than it was in 1900. So that conveyance of it growing over time doesn't exist kind of in the description of the image itself, the alt text. So that conveyance of what happens. So that's what makes this required if in fact you were trying to get a, a learner to understand what is this image conveying to you. So that's um, why the prod node is there and why the prod node is required on this specific image. Um, and so we did note on here that the complex image has a long description, which is essential for understanding. So that's again, why it's, why it's required there. Um, and I think that's all I have for this, this specific um, image. And um, I just wanted to point out how we're using the notes for the credits. So you'll see that there's a note graph here with a class of EndNote. And so underneath each image, there is a link that will take you to the credits page within the uh, inclusive uh, version of the uh, document. And here we're using the note ref and note uh, elements. So I just wanted to highlight that. Yep, and that'll actually, the next image, Luis, oh, actually perfect. shows you. Yep, it's, no, perfect, perfect transition right to here. So this actually shows you the XML that we use within the NIMAS file set that um, is the credit for this image. So this happens to be, you can see that it's image uh, credit number six, the number six is showing in the image on the right. And so this is pulled out of the EndNote section at the very end of the NIMAS file. And again, you can see that um, we have the Creative Commons licenses. So that's all spelled out there um, as well. And the title of the image and the link back to the ID. So if you flipped back to the the screen before, you'd see that it says credit six. ID equals credit six is right under the note ref class equals end note. ID ref equals pound credit six. So that ties that image to that credit that's actually listed at the end of the XML file. Okay. All right, so we just covered that. Super. All right, so, so we have the interactive components that really do bring to life the digital version. Um, and we listen to the Coyote Yelping, which is a really nice feature, I think, um, in this content for you to really understand all about coyotes. Unfortunately, um, NIMAS cannot accept those pieces. So if you're gonna have a, a piece of content that might be missing something, we thought it was important to at least note within the XML file. So it says the audio file available in digital materials has been removed. We have to remove it because there's no place for it to belong in there. Um, and just, just um, pointing out the fact that it can only be uh, static text and images within the NIMAS XML file. So because of that, we had, to, we had to remove that, but we did want to put a note in there. And so anywhere there was that, we did put a little note inside the XML file saying that the audio files were removed because they had to be removed. Glossary. All right, so Luis hinted to the glossary. So the glossary inside of the All About Coyotes is really part of a larger ecosystem of, of language learning and vocabulary learning. So the glossary words are chosen very, very carefully um, from the academic word list. So our instructional designer went to that academic word list, did an analysis of the text here to figure out what are the, the 10 words in this content that will move the students forward in their language learning, the vocabulary language learning. So that is really that whole system of language and vocabulary learning is really outside the scope of the NIMAS content. But those 10 words were chosen on purpose and were, um, were, were related to this content. So what we felt was important is that those vocabulary definitions should be included inside this content. Even though when you're inside Clusive, it really starts to know who you are. And if you've already said, um, in this case that I, that I already know a word, it won't show you those glossary words. It'll start to know you and your glossary learning and your vocabulary learning. And so it'll decide whether to show or not show some things. So even though that that's there, um, the visibility, so the note here says the vis visibility of the glossary words in the digital format is adaptive based on your knowledge and interests. So that all of that is true, but these custom words are available in that digital format whether they were highlighted or 
or not highlighted in there, if you had clicked on any of those words that were part of the interactive glossary for that, you would have seen that nice uh, pop up that that Louise showed you. Um, any word you can use uh, will, will pop up with a dictionary, but you might not get a custom, nice, uh, media rich uh, vocabulary word the way that um, the one that Louise had um, in there. So that that does exist. So just to give you that background. And so we did put a note in there, the glossary does not appear in the digital format in this form, but we did think it was important for learning the glossary words associated with this content. So hopefully that 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 um, that makes sense for you. So we can go on. Yep, and so here what we have is one of the glossary entries. Um, I don't think this is the one that Louis showed you. He showed you the one with that beautiful lion picture. Um, so here what we have on the left-hand side is the word appreciate. And then um, here's the NIMIS equivalent to that, um, to that uh, digital glossary. And so the definition is there. So we're using the um, definition list structure for our glossary. So we're using the DL structure. The word is appreciate. Um, and then we have our definition, we have example there, um, and then we have the image group that we show, and there's the beautiful image on the, on the right-hand side that shows um, the young man appreciating. Um, the, grand, the grandfather appreciates his grandson's help, um, as well as we have um, the prod note in here, the prod note is optional. So unlike where we absolutely had to have it on the image of the map, here we have an optional prod note for um, the description, the longer description. All right, and so that's all I have for the NIMIS XML. Um, I wanted to just point out that the OPF, so since we were using an EPUB format, we actually had an OPF for that EPUB and the OPFs for both of these files were actually fairly similar. Um, but I did wanna point out just where there was a difference and where we felt it was important for you to know um, if you were doing this um, digital to NIMIS conversion. So um, we did put a description note in here that says the digital instructional materials and just noting that the original digital resource includes audio clips. So there's some information about what's different about this um, NIMIS file and where did it come from? And just so you would have some information. So that would be important if you were developing this to put some, some um, notes into your OPF file. Otherwise, the, um, the other content was pretty straightforward and pretty similar to a standard um, OPF file. And I think that's all that I had, but I see that there's a question, um, a question in, in the chat. Um, and if, so if you have any other questions, um, thinking about this, reflecting on this, uh, please do put that in the chat. And um, let's see, Liz, do you wanna read the question or? Yeah, sure, I can do that. Um, the question was, um, it was mentioned earlier that alt text isn't always required by NIMIS. Was that just for a specific use case? I was under the impression that alt text needed to accompany all images when converting to NIMIS. This is Nicole. I, I'm happy to chime in on this particular question. And this is a, a question of best practices versus the requirements of the technical specification itself. The NIMIS technical specification does not require alt text, but it is recommended because it is very valuable. So if you're providing alt text, thank you. Uh, it's a great practice and it's something that we do recommend but we will not reject files for the NIMAC because they don't require, if they don't have alt text simply because it is not a requirement of the specification itself. So hope, hope that helps clarify. And we will second that, Nicole. <laughs> As Lynn <laughs> said, um, both of us and um, generally a lot of the people that practice in the accessibility field are big fans of alt text. It really adds a lot to the user experience and. Um, being able to get that rich content uh, when you have those descriptions of the images. Yeah, and to reiterate um, what Nicole was saying earlier, that um, in this case, the Clusive is a fully accessible version, but um, you can still convert that into, into NIMAC. If you're pulling from an accessible version of digital, 
Um, and even if it's only partially accessible, you probably have alt text already, because if you were building a digital version, you probably have alt text for your images. So don't please don't strip them out if they have already been built within the context of your material um, to submit to, NI to, the, to the NIMAC, because um, um, having them is, is wonderful if you, if you do have them. So any other questions about the uh, NIMIS XML? Um, the link to the exemplar creating NIMIS from a digital material, that um, you can download that, unzip that file, and you'll be able to see the, um, the NIMIS file that we've gone through and you can go back and look at it with the highlights um, that I've pulled out of that for you rather than um, maybe making you a little dizzy showing you the XML. XML file directly. Um, I felt I felt a little anxious. Well, you said you could just show them the XML file. I said I could show them the XML file, but I didn't want any of you to um, strain your eyes. But please do feel free to download that. Um, any questions or comments, even after today, we we would welcome any feedback. This is a question that came through the chat, but it it came directly to me. But I think it's it's um, it's probably something that that publishers are thinking about, and I don't know that there's an answer, but I think um, one question is how much interactivity is too much interactivity? And do you have any, do you have any guidance or thoughts that you could share at this point on that particular question? So I think that if there is a, is a structure to the content underneath all that interactivity, because there's actually quite a lot of interactivity inclusive um, when you think about it there's there's ways to modify the screens you can jump around you can you can listen to the audio so there's quite a lot but there is a core content underneath all of that so I think if if there's even if you have say an interactive story if there's still a story underneath that interactivity that can be told um, in a beginning to end way then that would be able to be converted. That's um, that's how I'm thinking about it. Luis, do you have? Yeah, and, and with the audio files, for instance, there you have to interact with that audio content. There is a player and it will show up in different ways depending on the web browser, um, but you do have to navigate to it and you have to be able to interact with the actual embedded audio file. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why um, that was left out. So really is the, as, as um, Lynn mentioned, you know, the underlying content, um, the static text, the images um, that we can port over and into a valid NIMAS file. Um, that's the important uh, uh, first layer, right? That you need yeah. to address. And to, to add to that, if I think if we had, we happen to have audio files in this example, they were only sounds. They were sounds, they were sort of, immersing in the coyote and learning about the coyote. If there was a conversation in there, what I would have done as part of this is I would have pulled that conversation out and put a transcript right in the, the text. So I would have pulled that text out and made it available to NIMAS. So even if it is, if you have some limited media in there and there's content that can just be pulled out that's part of this, I'm gonna use quotes here, the story of the content, I think then you can still submit that you can pull that content out, um, you know, app appropriately put the folks who said it, if that's important to the, to the, um, the content itself. And I think that that can be pulled out and put into the NIMIS as well. So I don't, I don't want to say that if there's some interactivity that it can't be pulled out. If it tells the story and you can pull it out in text, then um, I think it can be added to the NIMIS file set. Thank you. And, and just to kind of build on that, I, I do think that one of the things that's important to keep in mind is that, you know, EPUB but in particular, it, it has such a range of, of things that you can do with it and things that you can link out to. Um, and, and not all EPUB, um, depending on where the actual content resides, because you could, you could have an EPUB that has most of the actual instructional content linked out and residing on a server somewhere uh, in a learning management system. And so you might think, oh, well, it's EPUB. I can just turn this EPUB into, into a NIMIS file. But if the actual content, if it's not a self-contained EPUB and, and a lot of the content actually, you know, whether it's, whether it's 
uh, you know, video or audio or just actual text, if it lives somewhere else, that's also something that's not going to be an effective NIMIS file. Um, and that's probably obvious, but I just wanted to mention that because I have seen uh, EPUBs that, 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 that are that way. It's an EPUB, but the instructional content is actually linked out of that EPUB and lives somewhere else. And so that would be an example where that you, you could create a NIMIS file, but you would just be saying, this links out to somewhere else. This links out to somewhere else. And right, right. that's not going to be effective. So. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of additional questions that came in. Uh, so thank you, Lamonique, for your questions. Uh, so the first one is media-like games would not have the content piece as described. So that would be ineligible. Uh, that is correct, uh, Lamonique. Uh, Games typically have some sort of logic to them as well. And so that would be really difficult to convey in the NIMAS format. So Lynn, do you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, I was gonna add about the branching, especially in, in media type games, you might go to places where only one or two users end up actually going to that specific place so that anything that doesn't have kind of a start, beginning, middle, end, uh, in logical order, I think would be really hard. So I, I do not think that most media, I don't, I don't say all, but I would say that most media like games, um, unless there's a kind of a story that flows behind it, I don't think that that would be eligible or be very, very difficult and probably not a great experience for the end user um, from the NIMA side. And then um, the question about captioned videos, would that be able to be pulled out? So I think that it really depends on uh, what portion is video versus text and whether that makes sense. Luis, do you want to, you sound like you look like you want to respond. No, I was just going to say that, that the, the game would be sort of like the glossary inclusive where there is an adaptive component to it. And a lot of games have that adaptive element to them where depending on the choice that you make, you may see content or not. So uh, in some ways it's very similar to that glossary, but in, in the glossary, because people at some point were gonna see all 10 of those words, that was part of our uh, rationale for including them in the, uh, in the title mm -hmm. or in the, in the XML version. Mm -hmm. So the question is about captioned videos. And I did sort of allude to that. If there was some media in, in my, com in my uh, content, but if it were all media, I think there's a point, a tipping point where I'm not sure that the, that the, uh, you know, text equivalent is in fact an equivalent. So I guess I would, I would question how much content there is. If there's a video in the middle of a large story and that you can pull that out, then that feels on the, yes, very much so. If it's mostly video and you start to lose the storyline, that's, much less so that experience would not would not translate very well. Luis? No, I don't have anything to add. That's a great uh, comment. So thank you so much okay. for those excellent questions. Yeah. Uh, great questions. Lemme. Thank you. This is uh, we love these questions that you're bringing up. So we have a few more minutes. If you have any questions, you could either use the chat or you can unmute yourself. Um, Lynn and I are very informal. We're very, uh, you know, uh, welcoming of your questions. So uh, feel free to mute yourself if that's easier as well. While you think of those questions, um, I think I'm still sharing on the screen. Again, I just want to reinforce that we have, um, there's a couple of FAQs. So the NIMAC has one that uh, Nicole and her team have put together that has some really great information. And we have one on the AIM Center website as well. Uh, so those two resources really provide answers to a lot of the common questions. And then again, uh, like Lynn mentioned, uh, the exemplar, you can download the file uh, you can open it up, unzip it, open it up, and then within the exemplar, there's lots of comments uh, that can really help you figure out what we're trying to do within uh, that XML file with some good explanations. And then obviously, you could also open up Clusive and have the two side by side. We didn't want to make you seasick this morning by going back and forth, but you could do that at home. You could open up Clusive try out the title yourself and then have the exemplar as well. And that would make a nice comparison for you of how we uh, transfer things over.
And thank you, Liz, for dropping those links in the chat. We really appreciate that. It makes our jobs of presenting that much easier. <laughs> And um, in addition to these resources, the other thing is you can always reach out to us. Um, we're available to answer any questions that you have. So I will, we will share our contact information. And of course, Nicole is also an amazing resource. So she's been really, really helpful throughout the creation of this exemplar. It's been a, a team effort uh, from the AIM Center, from the NIMAC. So we really value that partnership. Uh, so you can connect with any of us. The, the three of us uh, are happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh, but uh, for Lynn, it's LM, L -C -C -O -R -M -A -C -K at cast.org. And for myself, it's lperez at cast.org. Uh, so we'll drop that in the chat as well for you. Um, and of course, you can also reach out. I'm sure Nicole won't mind if you have questions as well. I will not mind. And actually, to make it even simpler, if you want to just email NIMAC at aph.org, that is a great place to send any inquiries, or you're very welcome to email me directly. And that is ngains at aph.org. Question? Hey. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Hi, Louis. Um, I wanted to ask this rather than try to type it. Um, in general, the, for the for a publisher like who I work for to take the initiative to do this, um, is it generally done because uh, a school district or a client is requiring me to do it, or am I doing it just to be a good world citizen? To because it, it's a good thing to do. I mean, like, what's the genesis of getting publishers to do this in the first place? So that's a good question. I think Nicole alluded to it earlier that you may uh, start to see it's really up to the, uh, you know, state or local educational agency to put in that language in their contracts and purchasing agreements. So they can already do that, uh, you know, requiring publishers to submit a NIMAS file. So you may see in the future that they will include that language related to a digital uh, title. Um, it all seems very vague, though. You know, like that when you look at that NIMAS flow chart, it like it looks like you have to do this, but then all of a sudden you come to a point where like we well, don't really have to do it, you know, unless somebody writes it into a clause of your purchase agreement. Right, and this is Nicole, and I'll just kind of uh, hop in on this question. Uh, and, and yes, I mean, basically in terms of what the notice does, it, it does not impose any blanket requirement on publishers. It simply says that the NIMAC is no longer restricted to only accepting NIMAS for print-based instructional materials. In terms of that, the decision of what comes to the NIMAC, that has always been, that has always been located in the relationship between publishers and their customers because the mechanism in IDEA uh, has always been if you want NIMAS for this particular program, when you adopt that program, you include the NIMAS requirement in your adoption contract or purchase agreement. And that is the, the only mechanism to require NIMAS. Um, again, in terms of that whole question about being a good citizen, we are, we are always pleased when, you know, you may not have a requirement, but you decide, hey, this is gonna be really good for students. So I'm gonna go ahead and, you know, maybe I'll have a contractual obligation later uh, but I'm just going to go ahead and, and provide NIMAS right now. That's totally fine. Um, but yes, it's still, it's still a matter of, you know, the only obligation is imposed at the point of having a contract from a customer that includes the NIMAS language. Yeah. What we found is very few of our customers have actually requested it or expected it, required it. And even when they do, I don't get the feeling they know why they're asking for it. They've probably been to a presentation where someone urged them to do it, you know. So I, there's, um, it just, I'm all over it. I would like to do it all the time, but it's kind of makes it difficult for me to make the case to my superiors to why we should put you know, resources and energy into doing this. I'd be interested in having a follow up conversation about that. Um, I mean, all all 50 states and then also the outlying areas have all coordinated with the NIMAC. So every state is working with the NIMAC. They're, you know, they download files, right. they use these files to produce accessible formats. So if you're finding that you have 
customers who don't seem to understand, we, we'd be very interested in talking with you more about that right. so that we can we can figure out if there are some some folks who need a little more guidance yeah. in terms of benefiting from it. I will say we're a pretty small it. publisher compared to the to the big players. So thank you. I, I don't know if you heard my my answer. Was I muted by mistake earlier? Oh, <laughs> I think you might have been, Luis. Oh, okay, no, but basically you said what I was going to say, Nicole, oh, okay. <laughs> regarding the requirement. But um, to the second part of your um, question, um, definitely in terms of um, providing, you know, as we move more and more to the creation of digital materials um, or born digital, we also want to make sure that we're able to convert that content into other formats like Braille. So especially for some of the younger students who, you know, may not be uh, able to use things like a refreshable Braille display and still need hard copy Braille. We want to make sure that that content can be um, as much as possible if it is able to conform to NIMAS that we're able to convert it so that again those students have access to that content. So uh, that you know that gets to that second part of your question that uh, you know this is uh, not just uh, a requirement but also something that increases access to educational resources and educational opportunity. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Luis. And thank you also for, for just mentioning that, you know, one of the things that we've heard a lot more about recently is that even when digital curriculum is accessible, it is important to keep in mind that uh, especially very young children, they, ne they may not have the technical skills to be using a refreshable braille keyboard or other technology with the curriculum. So there's that whole piece in terms of the expectations. It's kind of like, okay, it may, it may meet these accessibility criteria, but in practice, is it really usable? Is it feasible given uh, the age of the student, the, the technology skills of the student? So that's a really good point. All right, well, it looks like um, we are close to the end of the hour that we had slotted uh, with each other this morning. Um, I think I speak for Lynn and Nicole that we really enjoyed this uh, webinar. We enjoyed your questions as well. Uh, they were, uh, gave us some food for thought as well. So we really appreciate that. But uh, in the next couple of minutes, if you still have um, some questions, we're gonna stick around until the end of the hour. So we're happy to uh, engage in further conversation with you. And again, you can reach out to any of us and then we have lots of resources uh, that you can reference and highly, highly encourage you to download that exemplar. And if you have any feedback about it, we welcome that as well. And just to chime in uh, from the NIMAC side, uh, this has been really uh, informative and helpful. And I really appreciate Luis and Lynn uh, being available this morning and providing this uh, the presentation. And um, so thanks very much. This has been really, really great and really informative.